The date was July the 17th, in the year 180 after Christ. These people were accused of a crime which could carry the death penalty. This is the ancient city of Carthage in North Africa, not far from the international airport for the modern city of Tunis. The nation of Tunisia is rich in history, culture, and tradition, and in the lives of great North African men and women. Long ago, Carthage was the capital of the Roman province of Africa Proconsularis, a region that today would include Tunisia, northeastern Algeria, and part of the coastline in Libya. Carthage was one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Our story today is about 12 people, seven men and five women, whose integrity and bravery in the face of death have inspired admiration around the world. They are known as the Silliton Martyrs. These people were accused of a crime which could carry the death penalty. The law they had broken did not come from Carthage or anywhere in North Africa. The law came from across the Mediterranean, from Rome. And their crime? Refusing to burn incense to the gods of Rome or to the statue of the emperor. They refused because they were Christians. The judge who was to try their case was Vigelius Saturninus, the Roman governor of the province. He carried the rank of proconsul. The men carrying the rods were called lictors. The bundles of rods showed the power of the proconsul to inflict corporal punishment by beating people with rods. The axe in the bundle showed his power to give the sentence of death. The letters SPQR represented the Latin phrase Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and people of Rome, the power that ruled the empire. No one knew what the outcome of the trial might be, but they knew it could be difficult and people were on edge. July the 17th. The date was important. On March the 17th, exactly four months before this trial, the old emperor Marcus Aurelius had died in Central Europe. The new emperor was his son, Commodus, erratic, moody, unpredictable, Ruthless, probably mentally unbalanced. This would make it difficult for the proconsul, Saturninus. He was in a delicate political situation. He might want to show his mercy, but on this day he must stick to the letter of the law. Politically, he himself was on trial. The names of the prisoners were Sparatus, not Zalus. Cetinus. Citus. Donata. Secunda. Bestia. Vettorius. Felix. Aquilinis. Lightages. Januaria. 
generoso. Their names were Latin, except for two, Nozalus and Satinus. They were descended from the original Punic people of Carthage, truly North Africans. Why did the Romans feel it necessary to prosecute these people? They were not thieves or disorderly. They were respectful, loyal, law-abiding citizens, and they paid their taxes on time. Jesus Christ himself had told the Jews to pay their taxes to Caesar. Pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. And the Christians obeyed the words of Jesus. So what was the problem? The Romans didn't really care what gods you worshipped or how many gods. But there were three different factors that worked together against the Christians. The first was the Christian public denial of all gods except one, the one they worshipped. The Romans believed in many gods and goddesses. These divinities seemed much like human beings, except they were immortal and had supernatural powers. The gods of other countries were called by different names, but if they appeared similar in some way, they were regarded as the same gods. The Romans had no problem at all with people in the empire introducing a new god to join all the others. But the Christians were different. They insisted that the other gods did not exist, or that they just represented demonic evil spirits. To the Romans, this seemed intolerant, even atheistic, and the Christians were resented. In North Africa, just like the rest of the Roman world, many people's lives were filled with superstition. And for them, the gods were real, in one way or another. For others, the old religions were simply part of their traditions and their culture, and for that reason, not to be rejected even if they didn't really believe in them. Intellectuals were inclined to look on the gods with total disbelief. But at the same time, they were very willing to hold positions in the temples that gave them prominence in society. About 260 years earlier, Quintus Mucius Scaevola had held the position of Pontifex Maximus, the head of the Roman state religion. He is quoted as saying that all religion was of three kinds. One, the writings about the gods by the poets that were merely imaginative. Two, the religion of philosophy. And three, the religion of the state that kept the lower classes of society under control. In other words, complete skepticism. And he was a Roman priest. Did this hypocrisy bother his fellow Romans? Not at all. Take, for example, the sacred chickens. Before the Roman army went into battle, the sacred chickens must be fed. If they ate the grain quickly and some of it fell on the ground, this was a sign of certain victory. So just to make sure, the chickens were starved for a while before they were offered the grain and victory was assured. But the old traditions must be observed. The Christian refusal to take part in any kind of pagan ceremony was irritating. If they could just keep their mouths shut and play along with the traditions, everyone would be satisfied. One of the oldest superstitions in Rome involved watching the flight of birds. They believed that these were signs of good luck or bad. What type of birds were in the sky? How high? And how fast were they flying? And where were they flying from? And where were they going? It could be a sign of bad things to come. But perhaps things might change. The sight of an eagle or a bird of prey was much better. This was a sign of victory in battle, they thought. All was well. For the Christians, any kind of fortune-telling like this was forbidden by the Bible, the Word of God. 
The second factor that worked against the Christians was the Roman suspicion of any group of citizens who met privately on a regular basis and were not under state supervision. From the beginning, the city of Rome had a bad history, a tragic history of division and violence between rival families and factions fighting for political control. When Rome became powerful and controlled the whole Mediterranean basin, including North Africa, it just became worse. Emperors were assassinated and civil wars, Roman armies fighting each other, tore the empire apart. The Roman emperors and their administrations became paranoid about plots and conspiracies. People meeting together in groups, privately, away from public scrutiny and government control, were looked on with suspicion. People could go to the amphitheater to watch the gladiators, or to a chariot race, or the theater. But that was very much in public view, and the government knew everything that happened. Individuals could belong to a burial club or society where the members paid their dues into a common fund for funeral expenses. They would attend each other's funerals and occasional events. But a funeral was for the most part in public and everyone understood what the burial club was all about. People could attend ceremonies in the Roman temples, including the dinners that followed. But these were not regular get-togethers privately, like the Christians. Closer in concept, perhaps, were the philosophers, who held classes, teaching and leading discussion. But again, this was an accepted part of Roman life. The Christians said they met just to pray and read their holy books. But who would want to do that? People thought there must be another motive. What could it be? The third factor was the absolute refusal of Christians to burn incense to the emperor's statue and swear by his birth spirit. The Romans believed that every man had a spirit that accompanied him from birth to the grave. They called it a genius, some people would say genius. Every woman they thought had a spirit called a Juno. The genius or genius of a man was associated with his destiny and his good fortune. So, as a token of their loyalty to the emperor, citizens might be officially required to take an oath of allegiance, swearing by the genius of the emperor. To refuse this was a sign of a traitor. A similar way of showing loyalty was to make a small offering of incense or wine to the emperor's statue or the image of the emperor's genius. You didn't have to believe in all the gods and goddesses. Just show your sign of loyalty in the traditional way. But for the Christians, this was idolatry, and they would have none of it. So they were regarded as traitors to the state. And there you have it. Adding extra gods? No problem. Openly denying the traditional gods of Rome? Big problem. Meeting privately on a regular basis, paranoid suspicion. Refusal to swear by the emperor's birth spirit and offer incense or wine to his statue, these people must be traitors, no matter how good they appeared. They must be put to death. So, now let's see the trial. The language was Latin. You may receive mercy from our lord the emperor, if you will return to your senses. We have not done wrong. We have not allowed ourselves to do anything unfair. We've never spoken badly about other people. But when we ourselves have been treated badly, we have given thanks. 
because we obey our emperor. We are also religious and our religion is simple. We swear by the birth spirit of our Lord the Emperor. And we pray for his good health, which you also have a duty to do. If you will listen calmly, I will tell you the mystery with simplicity. If you are going to speak badly about our sacred rituals, I will not listen to you, but take the oath by the birth spirit of our Lord, the Emperor. I do not recognize the authority of this world, but I serve that God whom no one has seen or can see with these eyes. I have not committed theft. If I have bought anything, I pay the tax, because I recognize my Lord, the King of kings and ruler of all nations. Give up these ideas. It is a bad idea to commit murder or commit perjury. Do not allow yourselves to be part of this madness. We have no one to fear except the Lord, our God, who is in heaven. Honor to Caesar as Caesar, but fear to God. I am a Christian. I want to be what I am. Do you persist in being a Christian? I am a Christian. Do you want time to think about this matter? In something so right as this, there's no need. Uh, what things do you have in your box? The books and letters of Paul, a good man. Take 30 days to reconsider. I am a Christian. Secunda and the others have confessed that they live according to the Christian religion, have been given opportunity to return to the way of the Romans, and have obstinately persisted. We give thanks to God. Today, we are martyrs in heaven. Thanks be to God. The deaths in Carthage of the Sillerton martyrs, as they became known, made a huge impression on Christians in North Africa not to scare them into submission to paganism, but to stiffen their resolve and stand true to their convictions, to the truth, above all, to the Lord Jesus Christ.
copies of the trial were circulated, and later, churches were built in their memory. How do we know what really happened on that day? The trial of the Sillerton Martyrs happened in closed court, or as the Roman said, in secretario. But the statements in court would have been written down for the official record. It seems likely that someone sympathetic to the Christians had access to the court records and leaked them to the Christian community. The Latin document certainly reads like a court record. It's interesting to see how these North Africans behaved during their trial. They knew that their lives were on the line. I think they knew they were going to die unless they denied their faith in Christ and offered incense to the emperor's statue. So they had made up their minds before they entered the courtroom, probably before they were even arrested. They did nothing to hide the fact that they were Christians. 17 years later, a Christian writer named Tertullian, a citizen of Carthage itself, wrote about the courage of the Christians. He addressed his remarks to the magistrates of the Roman Empire. You, magistrates of the Roman Empire, every evil is by nature soaked in fear and a sense of shame. Yes, criminals try to keep out of sight. They avoid appearing in public. When they are caught, they are frightened. When accused, they deny it. At least when found guilty, they moan about it. Is the Christian really like that? Not one of them is ashamed. Not one is sorry for it. When identified, they glory in it. When accused, they don't defend themselves. When they're interrogated, they even confess of their own accord. When condemned, they give thanks. It has none of the natural features of evil. Fear, shame, doubt, regret, despair. You cannot say it is madness. You who are guilty. Tertullian makes the point. What kind of justice was this? But go back just 68 years before this trial. In the province of Bithynia, in what is now Turkey, a special Roman envoy named Gaius Plinius Secundus, we usually call him Pliny, received an executive order from the Emperor Trajan on how he should treat Christians. Christians are not to be hunted down. If they are reported and found guilty, they must be punished, but on this condition that anyone who denies that they are Christian and gives proof of it by worshipping our gods on the basis of their repentance will be given a pardon, however suspect they may have been in the past. There you have it, the same pattern of accusation followed by pressure to convert back to the old Roman religion and punishment for refusal, usually by death. Marcus Aurelius, the emperor who had died just four months to the day before the trial of the Sillerton Martyrs, wrote in his meditations, So, keep yourself sincere, good, pure, serious, plain, the friend of justice, religious, kind, loving, strong for your appropriate task. Struggle to maintain it, what philosophy would have made you. Show reverence to the gods. Help other people. Life is short. Marcus Aurelius lived a life of self-discipline and moderation, and historians have said that the strong point of his reign was the administration of justice. But when the Christians in the Rhone Valley in France were being persecuted, he decreed that if they were Roman citizens, they should be beheaded. And if they were not, they should be put to death by torture for nothing else than being Christians.
What kind of system was it that killed people, not for anything they had done, but for what they believed? In North Africa, the Sillerton martyrs were not the first to suffer for Christ. Just a short distance to the west is the town of Madaurus in what is now Algeria. A Berber man named Namfanio had been arrested and killed for being a Christian, along with three other Christian Berbers, Lucetus, Migdon, and Samai. Some people must have sensed the injustice of this. In fact, sometimes we can see they did. In the trial of the Sillerton martyrs, the proconsul Saturninus did his best to let them off the hook. As Sparatus, the leader of the group, said, they had not committed any crimes. They had paid their taxes, and they were loyal to the emperor. They just refused to make a religious offering to his statue or swear by the Emperor's Genius. Saturninus knew this was true. He wanted to help them. He was caught between justice and what was politically correct at that time of history. He followed the legal precedent of the Emperors Trajan and Marcus Aurelius and condemned the Christians to death. The Sillerton Martyrs became heroes to the church in North Africa. But are they important to us today? It is estimated that over the last few years, about 100,000 Christians around the world are killed every year. The people in power who allow this must surely sometimes experience the same struggle between natural justice and conscience on one side and the social pressure and political interest on the other. It is like the Empire of Rome. We must also remember the Sillerton martyrs showed no anger against their persecutors. They were people of integrity, honesty, and a compassionate attitude even towards those who persecuted them. They truly followed the example of Jesus. Citus. Donata. Segunda. Bestia. Vitorius. Felix. Aquilinius. Lightentius. Januaria. Generos. It must have been difficult for their families and friends, but for the Sillerton martyrs themselves, their deaths were not a tragedy but a triumph. Death for them was not a door slamming shut on life and joy, but a door swinging open for life eternal in heaven and the joy of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.